Barry Gordy is here. He is the founder of Motown, need I say more. It had a profound influence on music, popular music. Think about the Jackson Five, think about Michael Jackson, think about Smokey Robinson, think about Dinah Ross and the Supremes, think about the Temptations, and you think about the man who created it all. His name is Barry Gordy. He has now written his autobiography called To Be Loved, The Music, The Magic, The Memories of Motown. Welcome. Great to have you here. It's wonderful. Ah, uh, it's my pleasure. Why'd you do this? Why did you now take time off from a busy career, uh, having soul Motown a part of it? Uh, you got plenty of money. You don't need to make any money. You don't need to. Uh, you got a lot of things to do, but you took time off, some four or five years, to write a book. Yeah, I. Um, so many times I've wished that my heroes. Um, who I've, I've admired through the years uh, had taken time to write their own story about what they did um, because when I read about them I'm reading what somebody else said they did but when you write your own book you not only write about what you did but you write about how you did it and more importantly more importantly why you did it and how you felt doing it. So it's a big, it's a big difference to me. Um, I um, wrote it for that reason, but many others. Another reason was uh, to kind of set the record straight for um, uh, all the young people that, that admired me out there or that look at what we've done with Motown and say, hey, I want to do that too. But they don't know how it was done, <laughs> you know. They think maybe it was done by devious means or something, and I want them to know that this was done with love, with care, um, with, with seeing the potential in people. Because my feeling has always been that um, less than 1% of all the people in the world ever reach their full potential. And... Raw talent alone is not enough, but it has to be developed. It has to be nurtured, and that's what we did at Motown. I mean, <laughs> you took raw talent and in one end, and at the other end, that was a star. We that was my goal. The similar line approach, but they would go in one door, an, a kid off the street, and out another door, a star. That was what I had hoped to do, and that's sort of what we did. You believed at one time you could make a star. Yes, of course give you a modicum of talent and you could make a star. You could take a modicum of talent. Well, I'm not sure I know what modicum well, is. Well, a small amount. I mean, not, okay. you know what I mean. You know, a small okay. amount. I mean, okay. not a, you did have to be Michael Jackson for you to be able to make yeah. a star. That, that's I mean, you, you understood you had the, you had the assembly line. Mm -hmm. You had the songwriters. You had the marketing. You had the whole package there at Motown. That's right. And, 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 and as important, we had... Uh, a group of people that I call the unsung heroes yeah. who had been pushing me for years to write a book. Whenever misinformation was out or something, they would want me to, 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 to defend it or to write about it or to say, this is no, Motown is a, a company of love, and they would want me to do mm -hmm. it. Those people, names you've never heard of and probably will never hear of again, but they were the unsung heroes. What charges offended you the most? What accusations about Barry Gordy? Um, rumors. Well, the, the only thing that really hurt me, I mean, there were many things, of, any misinformation offends anybody, you know, yeah. when you, somebody tells a lie about you or misinformation, it offends you, but, but the thing that really bothered me the most was cheating of the artist. They didn't get their earnings. Yeah, that was the thing that bothered me the most, because I, the, the irony of that was that I went into business because as a creative person, I didn't feel I was getting paid. And I felt that the, the companies that were in those days very small, it was a pioneering business, and I felt that that was unfair. It was, but more importantly, or just as importantly, it was bad business. You know, it was bad business. So if I started a company and I paid everybody, they would stampede at my door. That was very just logical. And so I started a company, a music company called Jobet Music. Right. 
To publish it, wrote the music. That, that, well, that published the songs right, right. for writers like me, and that company paid everybody, and that company has now been in business 35 years, the biggest independent publishing company in the yeah. business. And when you, you sold Motown, you kept that, right? I kept that. Yeah. So, because it, for economic reasons or other reasons? Well, um, uh, I don't know exactly what the reason was. It's just that I'm a songwriter and I love those songs. Those yeah. are like, those are, that's what I am. When Michael Jackson bought the rights to all the Beatles songs, did you advise him on that? Did you have anything no. to do with that? No. What a no, smart move it was, wasn't it? It was a smart move. I mean, yes. he's made a zillion dollars just from that, hasn't he? I don't know, but it I'm was a wonderful catalog, and, and he was he was smart to do it. Yeah. So part of this, though, was a counter, whatever negative criticism. You can set the record straight. This is my perspective. This is the way I did it. You know, I want people, I want kids to know they, too, can be Barry Gordy. Uh, right, right. And, and you can do it by dint of creativity, hard work. And you can uh, do it with values. With See, the point is that, that I grew up in a family with values. You know, my father... Uh, he, you know, had values. My family had values, and and those values stayed with me. Why well, just sell it? I mean, you know. Well, a lot of people thought, gee, you know, not this one. Don't sell Motown. Well, when you understand that the world has changed tremendously, and there are about there are about six companies now that control the distribution of about ninety percent of the music, right. and these corporate giants really control the business. So, as an independent you would not be very smart to stay in and try to fight this uphill battle, this constant uphill battle. And in my case, because of the rumors, misinformation and all that, even some of the artists believed it. And so I had to say, wait a minute, I'm in a different time, in a different place. Everybody's buying everybody. So I want to preserve the legacy of Motown. And then I'll be in a position to write a book and then, you know, because... I am a focuser. I like to focus on whatever I'm doing at the time. If I had focused on misinformation and rumors, I would not. There would not be a Motown out there now that's still growing. Right. There would not be Jobit Music that's uh, still growing. I'm gonna talk quickly about the artist. I mean, but they are so crucial to this story. Michael Jackson. How big a talent? Talent. The biggest. Talent, Mike. not stardom. Talent. Uh, the biggest. He's the biggest talent because Michael. I always called him Lil Spongy. You know, he was a sponge. I mean, he listened to everybody and everything. I mean, and he not only listened to me, he, you know, from the first day I auditioned Michael to studying James Brown, Jackie Wilson, Fred Astaire, Marcel Marceau, and putting them all together. He studied and Michael. Him. Oh, yes. He studied, he studied not only them, others. He studied Walt Disney. I mean, Michael worked hard. He was probably the hardest working artist I know because he did his, he would only eat things that were good for his health. At one time he was, <laughs> I think, uh, he was, uh, only eat watermelon, drink watermelon juice or something. I mean, going on a diet on a fast. I mean, Michael was serious and he wanted to be a superstar and he worked at it. And he, you know, he became what he worked at. Everybody that I know who's become a superstar in business, in pop. They worked at it. I mean, there's this amazing right. correlation between drive and desire and hard work and energy and perspiration and success. You know, That's I can't right. figure it out. It just That's seems right. to be That's right there. Right. He seems like a man-child, though. Is he? Well, I don't know what you mean by man-child. Well, you know, he's, a, he's 35 years old, but part of him is like a little boy. Yeah. Well, I don't know. When, when, when the Jackson 5 left Motown... I didn't keep up with the activities of what, what the artist did. I was too busy with, with right. you know, moving into my focus, which, which was developing the company, the legacy of the Motown, and stuff like that. Um, but Michael has always been a fantasist. He's been a dreamer. And I knew him as a kid, dreaming of this great everything. So yeah. Michael is a kid at heart, but many people are kid at heart. You know, they're, 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 you're a kid at heart. Oh, I'm I a know. kid at heart. See, <laughs> yeah. we're kids. Right. Right. We like to play, so... Steven Spielberg is a kid at heart. Yeah, so uh, I'm certainly that kid. I mean, I'm, I'm looking for my next project, my next right. this, my right. next that. I mean, so I don't know, man-child, you know, if, 
I just don't know what what's different about him other than he is a fantasist and he believes he's always as a kid. I mean, he he wanted to do something. So, but I don't really know. Um, uh, I don't. I haven't spent that much time with them since they left the company, which was years ago. Years ago. Diana Ross. Diana Ross is. She's classy. <laughs> Diana Ross is. She would. When the lights come on, Diana Ross comes on. I mean, I don't care what the rehearsals were. We would rehearse a number, and she would just be fair, rehearsals, so forth and so on. Or doing a movie, Lady Sings the Blues. I mean, we rehearse, and I would, you know, say, put it into rehearsal. And she would say, I'm, I'm doing it, I'm trying it. But, boy, when those lights came on, Diana Ross came to life. I mean, she's a money actress. For the money, she can do it, whatever it is. You loved her. I loved her, yes. And still do. But you do you still love her the way you did? I oh, mean, she's no. the mother of your child. That's right, yes. No. And five I, wives, eight children? I'm sorry? Five wives, no, eight children. No, five no. women, eight children. <laughs> no, no, eight children by five different yeah, women. Uh, yeah, yes. Not wives. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps. But, but she, was she the love of your life? Um, Diana. I would, I would say so, and looking back, yes, yes, because she gave me more thrills than, than anyone. Um, what do you mean by thrills? Well, thrills on the stage. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, when a when a person can do, her her thing was, when if you can think it, I can do it, <laughs> and and anything if I could you, think. If of, you can think it, I can do it. Yes, and what when you, I wanted her to do what? Lady Sings the Blues, play the life of Billie Holiday, she had never acted before, she had never done anything, but it was a thought I had, and I felt that she could do it, and she believed it. If I thought it, she could do it. And she did, and she was nominated for Academy Award, and the movie was nominated for five. Why didn't you two stay together? Well, uh, when she got married, I asked myself. A lot myself, of this book is about relationships. That's right. The book is about a lot of things. Right. You know, it's not just music, singing, and right. dancing, right. and so forth. It's about it's life. It's about relationship. About you're right. About life. It's right. about love. It's about winning and losing, and how to win, how to lose. Mm -hmm. You know, it's and it's about values. But Diana Ross, what, why didn't you stay together? Well, Diana, um, uh, I asked myself that same question when she got married. <laughs> um, <laughs> I said, well, wait a minute. The reason we did not stay together was because I knew what she wanted, and she wanted stardom in the worst way, and I wanted it for her. We had a goal. We had a, we had a, we had, we had, we had told each other that we would never let our relationship get involved with her career and my vision and my plan, and, and we were focused on that. But the relationship started getting in the way. It is very hard <laughs> to, during the daytime, be this director and this person directing this talent and not letting them get away with anything. And every time I would maybe question her, she may think it's an attack or something, yeah. but really I'm trying to, you know, I was, my standards were high. So... It's one thing to direct the person and do a lot of things like that during the day, during, <laughs> during the day, and then at night, try to be a cuddly bear. Hard to keep them <laughs> separate, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, and so... <laughs> so... So you come into the bedroom, and she say, you're no cuddly bear, because <laughs> I remember five hours ago. Yeah, yeah, and even if she didn't say that, even though she appreciated it, see, Diana was very in interesting, and, and um, even though we would fight over certain things that I might say in terms of directorial uh, remarks toward her or that it wasn't good enough. Whenever she did a show, it did, it did not matter who or anybody, what anyone said, it was like, what do you think, Black? You know. And if everyone says, you're great, you're terrific, you're, ma you're fantastic, if she wasn't really fantastic, I would have to say, okay, you were, you were very good, but... But. Right here, you could you could do better, you know, and that wasn't always uh, a good political thing to say, you know, to a top star that everyone says has you're done a best. wonderful job. Has Everybody says wonderful. you're the best, and you're saying you could be better. Yeah. Roll tape. Take a look at this. When I met Barry Gordy, um, I didn't know that he was going to have this kind of impact on my life, but I, as looking at, he was about, at that time, one of the brightest um, uh, young black men I had ever met. I mean, I saw him at, he was really 
someone who had a vision, who did not accept his life the way it was, but yeah, was... Who, built and, who founded and built Motown Records. Yes, and really had a vision. And did he's you also fall in love with him early? No, no, I didn't. No. It took you a while, though, to tell your daughter that she was... <laughs> his child. His child. Um, no, not really. Uh, it was just the way life... It didn't take that long. Yeah. No. But he was a role model and, and a strong influence because... <laughs> He was bright because he'd done something mm -hmm. because... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's really um, a marketing genius, I think. Yeah. You know, I don't think today people really understand what he did from nothing. It's just like taking a lump of clay and making something into... People think Motown is this big, big company. And right. it, when we were making records, it's this tiny little uh, building. You know, just a tiny building on West Grand Boulevard in Detroit, yeah. you know, where a big sound came from, no, the Motown he, sound. I, I, I don't mean to be gossipy, but I'm mm -hmm. only, I'm interested in him and, and as well as you. Was he in love with you? Yeah, I think so. He was? Mm hmm I think so. And you didn't, didn't... No, I loved him very much, but not a passionate kind of love, not the kind of love that I've had with my husband's. Yeah, okay. I loved him in, in, um, in, in a, a way you look up to someone that you admire and I, I have loved him, yes. You know, and thought I was passionately in love with him. But I now as I'm older I look back and I say, no, no, it's not weren't. the same. Yeah. This is different. And and what is the relationship today? It's good. Yeah. It's good. Um, I wish he were more out there. I wish he would do a talk show and talk about the things that he's done. I've asked him. I even ask him yeah. to write a book because I think the people should yeah. know the facts of the company to really know just how it came about, yeah. you know, how he had this dream. And, um, you know, I, I think he's going to write a book. I hope he's yeah. writing. I, I had no idea you were writing this book when she said that. I mean, what did you think of that? Well, I thought that was great. I thought that she was incredible. Um, um, and she, she looks phenomenal. <laughs> and and while you were watching that, you said to me, I wish I'd married her. <laughs> I said, well, and looking at that, it, you know, now I wish that maybe I had met her. But um, uh, I thought that was a wonderful clip. It's incredible. You know, it's really great. Um, Do you think you two saw it the same way? Oh, yes. Yeah. We, the, you, you know, it's a funny I mean, thing. It was sort of, there was a, she looked up to you, and so yeah. it, it was mixed with love and this whole thing. Yeah, she yeah. She looked I up to you. You were the boss. She looked up to you. You were a role model. You were a mentor. You were head of the company, you were a lover, but you were all that mixed up together. And part of that was the problem. Yeah, that, that's exactly what the problem was. It was a confusion. It was a confusing kind of situation. Um, but uh, we had this, you know, deep respect. And, and to me, respect turns into love. It's not the other way around. Right. Let me talk a little bit about the music business today. Um, Motown made what contribution? What contribution has Motown made to music? It did what? Well, there are several schools of thought about what Motown did. Um, uh, I'm probably not the best uh, authority. Well, give me on your what analysis. Well, you know, in 1968, we had five records out of the top ten. Before that time, we were looked at as a little black company in Detroit. Uh, while we were busy gloating over the five out of the top ten, um, as I say in the book, the, the corporations around the world were looking at what an impact black music yeah. is having on this general market, five out of the top ten. So they then started gearing up forces and, 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 and allocating funds and stuff to create... Uh, black artists. Black because artists. they knew there was a Create, you showed there was a market for black yes, artists. Yes. You gave black artists an access to a larger market. Yes. 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 Interesting too, because I mean, you know what they say about Elvis Presley. The notion is that Presley sounded black, mm -hmm. and that's why he was so popular. Yeah. Well, I don't. I don't know. Well, you know, I what just know that he, he had did. a sort of came out of rhythm yeah. and blues. There was a quality, as kind of a uh, rockabilly quality to it. It sounded a little bit like. Rhythm and blues. Well, it was it came rhythm, out of Mississippi. It was rhythm and blues. The Hound Dog was. Yeah. It was called rhythm and blues when it was first recorded, I believe, by Big Mama Thornton or yeah, somebody. Right. And uh, and then when he did it, he did it as bluesy as she did, but it was called pop. Right. <laughs> so, you know, those are tags that were put on the records, but I didn't. Um, 
I, I, I never believed in the tags. I believed in good music is good music. And um, that's why we, we just tried to gender market mm -hmm. our music all over every place. Duke Ellington once said, I don't know what people talk about, uh, uh, we talk about the difference in this music and that music. There are only two kinds of music, good music and bad music. That's it. Barry Gordy's book is called To Be Loved, The Music, The Magic, The Memories of Motown. Uh, it's interesting because the music and those artists still have a huge pull on so many of us who grew up during those years. Thank you very much, Barry. Great Thank to you. have you here.